Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to examine magic and the legacy of Aleister Crowley. With me is Gary Lockman, a regular guest. Gary is a historian of esoteric culture. He is the author of some 20 books on uh, thinkers in the field of mysticism and the occult, including Emanuel Swedenborg, Rudolf Steiner, Helena Blavatsky, P.D. Uspensky. He's written about the hermetic tradition and about the power of imagination. Once again, this interview is being conducted via the internet as Gary is an American living in London. So now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Gary. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. And uh, the interesting thing about our discussion today concerning Aleister Crowley and uh, the esoteric uh, movements that he was involved in is that we were both in our youth and in, involved with a subculture in which Aleister Crowley was largely regarded as a heroic figure. Oh, certainly. Um, when I first was getting in to all the sort of thing that I've been writing about uh, for quite some time now, um, Crowley was one of the first people that I came across. Um, this was in 1975. Um, and uh, it was when I was first uh, living in New York, and I was uh, first playing in a uh, band that would soon, well, become very well known, Blondie. And um, I was living. I mean, I've told the story in practically every interview, but it's it's just it just so happens to be the case. So here we go again. But I, I was living in a loft space uh, on the Bowery with. Uh, Debbie Harry and Chris Stein, obviously the singer and the guitar player, and they had a kind of um, fun pop interest in a lot of this sort of stuff. So you know, there was a, a few upside down pentagrams around and candles and that kind of thing. And um, but where we were living on in this loft space on the Bowery, there was this uh, very wild flamboyant artist who was very interested in Crowley, and I was particularly interested in Crowley's Toth Tarot deck. Uh, which at the time was still relatively rare. Um, it was available, but not everybody had one. And I, I owned a copy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I hadn't seen anything like this before. And um, he would do these impromptu readings, or he was also doing these big sort of paintings based on um, the, the figures in, in the, the tarot deck. And if you know the Crowley uh, tarot deck, it's this beautiful uh, fantastic, uh, you know, work of art, actually. And um, I just got very interested in it. I mean, it around the same time I started reading Colin Wilson, his book, um, The Occult. And he had a long chapter on Crowley in there. And um, he just became fascinating, you know, for me. And so it, that was sort of the springboard into um, all of this sort of stuff back then. And the interesting thing is um, that he remains an esoteric figure, that has um, its own place in pop culture as well. I mean, my first book, Turn Off Your Mind, was about the occult revival in the 1960s. And by the late 60s, you know, people like Jung and Madame Blavatsky and, and some others were turning up in the pop uh, context and music and all that. But they didn't sort of linger on as icons, this much overused word, uh, as Crowley did. So, I mean, Crowley today is still part of the pop culture, I mean, um, in rap, music, and all that kind of thing. So it was just interesting that my first encounter with him wasn't, you know, I, I didn't meet some emissary of a secret society, and, and I, I wasn't on my own esoteric quest. I was playing in a rock band in New York, and, you know, these books are hanging around, and, and then also because he was interested in drugs and all that, so that was sort of the other, um, you know, kind of interest. But yeah, you know, this was something that happened at the very beginning. Now, it strikes me that uh, Crowley today would be widely regarded as a, a teacher of esoteric subjects, but I don't think anybody would call him a spiritual teacher. 
Well, he has his own peculiar way of thinking about those things. But yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word spiritual um, in the way we usually use it to apply to him. Although he himself, I'm sure, at different times, I mean, he, well, he said he was a hell of a holy guru and uh, things of that sort. But no, he was much more um, the dark side. Uh, but he wasn't evil. I mean, that's one of the things I try to make out in the book. He just was very thick-headed. I mean, he was oblivious of other people. Um, and, you know, you can see that happening in his childhood and all this. And this was this kind of almost autistic kind of disregard for the reality that was around him. And, I mean, you can... I don't mean to reduce all of his ideas about magic to something along those lines, but I think there is sort of an, an, an element of it in there. Um, but, no, he wasn't evil. He just was very, you know, just... Uh, oblivious of other people and uh, this freed him up to do a lot of you know, things a lot of other people uh, uh, don't get around to doing and this is another reason why he became a hero because he had this adventurous life you know he was a mountain climber and he explorer and traveled and all this sort of thing so you know for someone like myself I was 19 and I came across this and um, out in the world really on my own in the sense of you know just you know charging out and, and, and doing things so this whole like this philosophy of the will do it without wilt and, and all of this was you know it was very fascinating and and uh, very motivating also a, a very key part of uh, Crowley's uh, esoteric development centers around a particular magical operation the book of the sacred magic of Abra Malin, the the mage uh, translated by you know, one of Crowley's own, I guess you might say, a mentor or a guru, S.L. McGregor Mathers, who was uh, one of the founders of the Order of the Golden Dawn in uh, England, a very influential esoteric organization uh, uh, that Crowley became deeply in, involved with. Uh, that's a very important part of the story. And I might mention parenthetically that Back in about 1969, I encountered that same book, and I had th that ambition to perform that magical ritual myself, which which I never did. But because uh, I I at one time had that ambition, I'm rather familiar with it. Mm. Well, it is one of the um, real uh, major um, magical uh, operations, and it's actually more. You know, it's it's more meditative. I mean, I, I never did it. I've read it. Um, again, this was one of the books that was actually available uh, back then in New York at the time when a lot of these uh, old occult books were put out in these cheap editions. So, you know, I'd come across that and all that. And yes, and this was the thing. It takes like six months and you have to have all these preparations and you have to find, you know, the right place to do it and seclude it. And again, it's a much more sort of meditative sort of yeah. kind of thing. And I, I do remember there was one book out in the 70s where someone had kept a diary of doing it. I, I don't remember the title or the author now, but I do remember there was one account of of uh, someone who actually went through it the whole way. But again, this was something that Crowley started and then stopped and didn't continue mm -hmm. uh, and put off at different times. And and um, or he 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 claims to have worked on it interiorly when he was doing this walk across China at one point. I write about that in the book when he was sort of on horseback and. Um, he wanted to complete, you know, some of the ritual and it was sort of, well, I could go back, you know, uh, put myself back mentally or I could just do it here in some way. And, and he sort of talks about doing it on the horseback, but I don't know if it really counts and all that. But um, still, yeah, this was something that he started and then stopped. And later people said, oh, this is why things went bad for him, because you didn't complete this and, you know, whatever powers that you were sort of invoking, you didn't you know, learn to master and, and so on. Well, I guess the ultimate question is, and, and we'll get to this in the course of our discussion, is how uh, successful was he as a so-called magician in, in uh, the ancient sense of, of the term, considering that uh, he, he inherited a fortune, he blew through his fortune uh, before he was, I suppose, around 40, probably well before he was 40, and uh, lived much of his life in uh, in poverty and one might say in misery. He, mm -hmm. he became a heroin addict. It, it hardly seems like the, the career of a great yogi. Well, you don't have to be a magician to blow a fortune quickly. I mean, there's lots of people that do that. But yeah, he 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 did devote a good amount of that to to that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, this was um, 
the thing with Crowley, uh, there, there is a sense where he had everything handed to him. Uh, and this was one of the worst things for him that, um, I mean, you know, obviously there's very serious interpretations of his philosophy of Telema, do what that will. And it's too easy to say, well, that just really turns into do what you want. And I don't mean to reduce it to that, but at the same time, it's difficult to not see where Crowley, you know, justified um, a lot of, you know, just basically getting things the way he wanted them to be, um, you know, in terms of this philosophy. But um, um, this was, yeah, he himself, uh, well, again, it, it all depends how you want to judge being successful at magic. I mean, there are many of the great, you know, magicians in uh, in the past have not had particularly good lives. They've all had sort of uh, troubled lot. Madame Blavatsky, she wasn't a ca- she was she was a character. She wasn't like like uh, Crowley, this the sort of wickedest man in the world. But she had you know she had a life where she went through a lot of suffering, a lot of trouble. You know, she was uh, attacked for being a fraud and things of that sort. And if you look back at other magicians through the ages, you know, not too many of them had very nice, peaceful sort of lives. Um, and that does seem to be something that's, you know, part of the tradition in, in some way. It, it, it never seems to profit um, the magician themselves, even, although, uh, you know, I don't know how successful was Crowley. I mean, we're talking about him. <laughs> so there were a lot of people who back then who, you know, they didn't have this life and they, you know, they kept to the straight and narrow and we don't know anything about them, but they had happier lives. So he's successful enough, I think, in what he wanted to do was basically being known. Again, this mm-hmm. was another uh, huge motivation behind him was the sense that he had this huge ego. And, he, and again, rightly so, because he was brilliant. He was talented, uh, but he knew it. Uh, and he made sure everybody else knew it. And um, he didn't have the breaks on that sort of thing that um, many people do, or the ones that you need, I, I would say, in order to you know be able to really you know uh, edit your own work so that you just don't think everything you write is is genius. And again, this was you know he grew up in this strange combination of this repressive Christian fundamentalist family, the Plymouth Brethren who really believed the end of the world was coming and a new age which was coming, much like Crowley himself would, would, would say in his own um, you know, philosophy. Uh, and they didn't, but they were very dour and they didn't celebrate Christmas or birthdays and things of that sort. But then his father, um, although he wasn't a brewer himself, he inherited this, this brewery and this whole chain of um, basic sort of uh, pubs, you know, Crowley Ale Houses, where people would go and have a pint and a sandwich. Um, and then uh, Crowley himself grew up to be a, a model child of this of this community. And it wasn't until his father died when he was 11 that um, Crowley said that he didn't stop believing in God and Jesus. He just went over to the other side. Um, he decided, you know, he had spent... I guess all his childhood, you know, sort of emulating Jesus and trying to do the good things. And his father was a preacher and he went throughout the land and he had pamphlets that he wrote, you know, promoting the Plymouth Brethren Creed. Again, much like Crowley himself would, would do with his own philosophy and uh, with Telemi, his own religion, that kind of thing. Uh, but then he went over to the other side and then he became, you know, the child from hell. You know, he, he's not Satanist in, in, in the sense that, you know, most of us understand Satan, but he does say in his, in his autohagiography that, you know, basically I went over to the devil's side, you know. Um, and then he, he became what I call an impossibilist. Uh, that's what he wanted to he, he, he took on all of the things that he's that no one said this, people said you couldn't do mm-hmm. and he was going to prove that he could do it and and he had this persistence in doing things like that you often refer to nietzsche in uh, your descriptions of crowley that he's something of uh, a nietzschean uh, anti-hero well this would be again one of the common things you would say he was sort of a nietzschean character in the sense that he was the superman or he wanted to be a superman uh and he was above Common humanity, which again, yes, it's a Nietzschean trope, but it, it gets very sort of popularized and, and and sort of you know turned into something else. But no, I mean Crowley certainly felt that he was, you know, he wasn't a Democrat, you know, he a socialist. He certainly felt he was above uh, the crowd, the mass, the masses, and all this sort of thing. And um, I mean, the first thing you know, 
He first rebelled against his family or against his family background, his mother, with sex. That was the first thing that really, uh, you know, sent him off. And this has sort of stayed with him for the rest of his life. Um, but later, when he inherited um, his, the fortune, this is when he could indulge in, um, you know, the sex, but also the drugs at the time uh, and and writing his poetry and living the life of something like Baudelaire or, you know, the sort of, if, if you know, this fantastic novel called um, Against Nature by uh Huismans, uh, where it's this fantastic uh, decadent aesthete who creates this whole you know world of beauty around him and and strange desires and so and so Crowley's sort of doing that and spending all this money you know decorating his room and and uh, and all this kind of thing and then paying for these volumes of his poetry t to be published. So I mean he that's his first kind of love is this sort of sex and poetry, and then um, he comes across magic. He comes across the whole idea of magic and um, he read in a book by A.E. Waite, which, uh, one version of which was called The Book of Black Magics uh, and, and Pax. Uh, this notion of this strange kind of hidden brotherhood, this, this hidden church, which really comes from this Christian mystic of the 18th century, uh, Karl von Eckharthausen. And it's this kind of hidden church, this kind of secret, invisible, you know, sort of Rosicrucian idea. And Crowley he wants to join them. You know, he, where where can he find them? And that begin that begins his search. And then he he meets this fellow when he's mountain climbing, and he realizes that he knows about alchemy and all this kind of thing. And this whole story where he's racing through the mountains trying to find him, you know, before he gets away. And and this is eventually how he you know comes to London and and joins the Golden Dawn. I think it's fair to say that uh, by the time he. Uh joined the Golden Dawn, he had already established himself uh, as a, a credible person in the field of mountain climbing and uh, probably a credible minor poet. Uh, well, even, well, some would say he was an incredibly minor poet, but I, I'll pass on that joke. But uh, no, he was certainly he was certainly known as a mountain climber. I mean, he certainly has achievements. I mean, um, uh, and I mean, I think today there's a rehabilitation about him. It certainly is. Um, I, I know in London, if you go to the National Gallery, there's a portrait of Crowley there, and it, it's a mountain climber and poet. And all. I mean, and then down at the bottom, it's sort of a cultist, this kind of thing. So it's very, <laughs> it's it's strange, you know. But you know, and but you know, that's the thing. I mean, eventually. All of the weird people in England just become sort of national treasures. You know, you start out as an eccentric, and then over time you become a national treasure, and then you're neutralized. And so, but um, but no, he's he no, he certainly he, he made two attempts on the Himalayas, and one was one was absolutely disastrous, and that ruined his his career, um, where he he failed to come to the aid of uh, his fellow climbers uh, in this mood of "I told you so." Uh, because there was this contrast between them, and you know he was leading the party, but they they uh, didn't like the way he was treating the uh, the locals, you know, who were sort of working for them. He was sort of you know showing them who was the boss, basically. So Crowley had a sadistic street too, and he had this character where he had to sort of you know sort of uh, tell show them, you know, the the British are here or something along the, that that kind of thing. And um, so the other climbers just they got sick of this. And then they said they were going to go, you know, down the mountain. And he said, no, if you go now, you, you'll never make it. And I mean, he was very good. He knew and he had instincts and he had this whole peculiar eccentric way of climbing. Uh, that, and, you know, which was the way he did practically everything. But what happened was exactly what he said. Um, they came into trouble and he could hear their cries for help, but he stayed in his tent. And um, I mean, this was the sort of thing. I mean, and he later exonerated himself and justified. He, he was a master at. I mean, I don't mean to say all these bad things about him, but he was. This is the, this was the bad side of him, which sadly was you know quite a bit, where he was able to justify um, you know everything he was doing and all that. Uh, but and I say in my book, I said you know if he really were a Superman, that would be the time to show it. You know, you go out out the door and you know, you do you know no matter whether you can save them or not, but you're there mm -hmm. rather than sort of just sitting in your tent and, and thinking I told. So, but that ended his career. But he actually, no, he, he had um, some some very notable accomplishments. Um, I mean, he was very good at what he did. Um, he did lots of things. Um, uh, but he, like I said, he he, he didn't. He wasn't a good editor, you know. So he, he basically let himself get away with everything all the time. Well, let's talk about the uh, Order of the Golden Dawn, which was so important in his career. Well, this was. Uh, next to the Theosophical Society, I would say probably the most important um, occult or magical organization in the late uh, 19th 
century, that was sort of its, its heyday. Um, it more or less fell apart after Crowley got involved. Uh, but this was something that um, – there's different stories of how it started, but the, the main sort of story is that one of the original members found this manuscript in a um, used bookshop over in a part of London called Farringdon. Uh, and um, with, within – it was sort of within a book, and, and then he, the manuscript came out, and he – it was in German, and it was written by a Fräulein Sch uh, Sprengler, and um, it came out that this was sort of instructions for um, initiating an order of, of um, a, a magical society uh, known as the Golden Dawn. And um, <clears throat> so eventually it was Wynn Westcott, um, William Woodman, I think was the other, and, and Mathers, who you mentioned. Uh, they were the, like, sort of the the original three, and um, it was basically a kind of hierarchical, it's not Masonic, Rosicrucian, I guess is uh, what they would call them, or they did call themselves, but um, it, it was basically a, a hierarchical system of magical initiation uh, and learning, uh, more or less following the Kabbalah. Uh, the path that you would go up. So there were different levels, you know, in sort of you, were the, you know, the initial, then one, then so on and so on. And um, the way it was, there was sort of different sort of sections. Uh, you know, students could only get so high, and then you had to go through a certain initiation to get into the next um, sort of level. And there was it was that sort of thing that led to the kind of um, breakup when Crowley got involved. Because, uh, as I said, Crowley was in the mountains, and he had met... Um, this fellow who um, was, knew about alchemy, and, and he tracked him down, and then he said, well, I'll introduce you to uh, the people when we get to London. And then so he was introduced, and he was initiated in Mark Mason's Hall, and I forget the exact date right now. Uh, and it had already been going on for quite some time, and um, one of the big members at the time was the poet W.B. Yeats, um, who uh, had already been in the Theosophical Society and continued in different sort of versions of the Golden Dawn after this, uh, the whole thing blew up around this time. And there's this famous story of Crowley and Yeats, and yes, Crowley had published, you know, self-published his poetry, but Yeats was a recognized sort of you know, legitimate poet. And um, Crowley, <laughs> Crowley tells a story where he, he showed Yeats some of his poetry. And... What he wanted from Yeats was, you know, hail fellow well met, yes, brother poet, and yes, yes, I see, you know, you're a genius and all this sort of thing. And um, and um, what actually happened was Yeats looked at it and I guess he just mumbled some, you know, kind of uh, polite, you know, kind of compliments or something. And this this was not what Crowley had wanted to hear. And he said that he knew immediately why, you know, Yeats reacted in this way is that he could recognize that his poetry was so great. You know, Crowley's poetry was so great that Yeats would never be able to to match it. So this was sort of, you know, this kind of the way, I mean, it's understandable. Why not? You know, if you, mm -hmm. you think you're good, why not? And all that. I mean, the other story along these sorts of lines is, you know, Crowley talks about the part of England, you know, where he was born, Lemington Spa. And uh, he said, um, you know, isn't it sort of odd that... that um, I'm paraphrasing it that you know some one one spot of England should should produce you know two of England's greatest poets, and because we should not forget Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, so this was so again you know and it's funny. I mean I think he's at his best when you allow him to do this, and this is why his Confessions of Elsa Crowley I think is one of his best books, and it's 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 very funny. He tells lots of great stories. He's a great rock tour and he's amusing. Uh, it, you know he can go on at length, but he 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 is able to do that. He, he seemed to have a sense of humor about himself when, when he refers to his autobiography as an autohagiography. You can tell that's tongue-in-cheek. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I, he, he did have a very good sense of humor. I was going to say he, he, he could be charming, and I guess this is sort of the magical side as well. I mean, he, he knew how to use, um, you know, uh, humor. And he also, you know, I guess you could say he used it as a, as a teaching strategy. He adds people like Matt Blavatsky did and, and Gurdjieff did, you know, they, in different sorts of ways. They were sort of pranksters or tricksters and they did, you know, uh, they made things uncomfortable for the people around them. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly something Crow <laughs> Crowley did. Um, and, um, but um, what had happened is that he had, you know, there was already a tension going on in the Golden Dawn because Mathers by this time was living in Paris. And he claimed to be the only one who was in contact with the secret chiefs. 
and the secret chiefs are um, this um, sort of like the, the equivalent of, of Blavatsky's masters um, along the same lines. They're these hidden figures uh, that um, they're supernatural, they're human, but they, they have super, you know, human powers, basically. And Mathers tells us, he, he relates how sort of having an audience with them is the, it, it, you can describe it as sort of like being near an elect- a lightning bolt and, and, and the smell of ether. Mm-hmm. I mean, having not had that combination myself, I don't quite know exactly what he means, but I, I get some idea. And so, and he talks about meeting him in the Bois de Boulogne in Paris and things of that sort. And, but he was the only one mm-hmm. who had direct contact with them. And this whole story about how the secret chiefs are fraud and all, all that kind of thing that's always in the background of, the, of these kind of uh, occult goings on. But that was his story, and, and he was having a contrast with the London group. And so, he, and he was in Paris, and he was studying at the library d'Art Arsenal, and so on. And he was married to the philosopher Henri Bergson's sister, uh, by the way, Moina Bergson. So that's another uh, interesting uh, uh, parenthetical thing there. And um, What had happened is when um, the Yates group in London here, they refused Crowley this initiation. They didn't because he nobody liked him. Uh, They you know they just they they felt he was a troublemaker. Yates just certainly didn't like him. He he didn't have a good word for him, and neither did Crowley have a good word for Yates. I mean, he tears him apart in his novel Moonchild. He he has this horrible kind of poison pen pastiche of Yates in there, and um, but. Crowley does, and he, he, he just ups and goes to Paris. And Mathers is looking for an ally now because there's faction, there's factionalism going on. And so um, he, he gives Crowley the initiation. Let, and, let's talk a bit about what this process involves being initiated in the Order of the Golden Dawn. Well, I mean, there's different levels of, uh, if, if, if you know the Tree of Life, you know, there's uh, Malkuth and Yesod and then uh, Hod and Netzach and um, Tifereth, and then that's sort of the first kind of level. And that's sort of within, I don't want to say, um, you can do that without meeting the secret chiefs, put it that way. So that's sort of, uh, it, that's sort of self-development. And, you know, there's various different practices and rituals uh, and exercises. And you um, well, visualize. For example, the, on, they had sorry. robes. They wore costumes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. I mean, there was all that. That was all I'm saying. That's sort of the Masonic or, you know, the regalia. I mean, it was a whole uh, ceremony. Uh, yes, yeah, so, you know, and based on a variety of Egyptian and Kabbalistic and Hermetic um Magical, you know, ideas and philosophies and so on. You, you, you do certain practices, you, you exercises, you, and you have to study and that kind of thing. And, and by the time Crowley had, I mean, he was a quick learner, but by the time he joined, he already knew most of the stuff that, you know, the, the lower levels. So I, I forget the exact names of the different titles, you know, yeah. but there's different kind of, um, you know, grades mm-hmm. that you get that, that are related to, um, the spheres on, on the tree of life. And, um, then sort of into the next sphere he wanted to go and they just didn't you know no matter how much you knew or whatever he would they they just didn't like him and they didn't think he really deserved um you know he was very pushy and all this kind of thing so they didn't think he deserved going up to the next level of initiation so he went and he went through the initiation there with mathers and so mathers being the head of the society uh, that should have done it but when he but he <laughs> basically Mathers sent Crowley back uh, to London to take over the the, the temple, and uh, and um, uh, this was sort of a, a famous battle uh, that took place uh, over in Hammersmith, um, um, the west side of London, uh, where Crowley shows up and he's in sort of Highland garb, and he's got a dagger and a and a black mask, and he also has got two kind of heavies brawler types that he's picked up, you know, in Soho or somewhere, they, they say like that. And, and he's gone there to sort of take possession of the temple. And it just turns into this, this fracas, you know, it just turns into this strange kind of, uh, uh, weird, you know, um, art thing that goes on and the police, you know, the police Bobby comes by and all that kind of thing. You know, it, it's almost like a money Python. You can imagine as a money Python kind of episode, but it turned into the battle of Blythe road. That's what it was called. This is fit. And, and that was, and that's kind of like sets the, the Golden Dawn sort of fractures after that. And and then Crowley himself goes off 
on his own adventures for a while, and then he comes back, and then he, he and then he sort of takes down Mathers. You know, he and Mathers have a have a, have a kind of in a battle. Uh, in in effect, a magical him. duel. Yeah, I mean, this is again, this is sort of thing. I mean, he was. Yeah, I mean, um, it's uh, you know, much of it is about power. I mean, Yates wasn't really like this in that way. I mean. Mathers was another sort of will-dominated kind of character, a very driven um, uh, personality, uh, and um, he was completely devoted, you know, to magic. And I mean, and it worked. I mean, I mean, it's it's, it's not just madness going on in these people's minds. I, I you know, I, as you know, I mean, these these things these things can work, and uh, there, there are these strange kind of uh, powers and capacities that um, we we can somehow break through into. Th- through some kind of extreme, you know, concentration of will, but you do have to be a character that can do that. And as we say, this is like an almost autistic uh, character to Crowley, where he he could focus his, you know, and he would just do it to prove a point. And um, and this was something that, in one sense, is uh, admirable, but it could be, you know, very uh, uh, something, you know, uh, very boring. You know, no, not boring, but I mean, it just would be it just sort of drive you out of your mind after a while. Um, but yeah, so Crowley, you know, the the it has a battle with uh, Mathers as well. And eventually he decides to set up his own um, magical society. And now uh, I guess it's important to point out that uh, he was involved in a number of different organizations. For example, there's one known as the OTO into which he was initiated. And uh, it's still known today as an organization uh, devoted to the practice of sexual magical rituals. Yeah, this was something a bit a bit down the line. I mean, in between that and the Golden Dawn, he started something called the uh, the Order of the Silver Star or Agentium Astrum, or the AA, mm-hmm. and it was his own kind of Golden Dawn. And uh, but I mean, you know, he did a lot of interesting stuff with that. One of the most uh, well known episodes was when he put on a um, version of the Lucian uh, Mysteries, and um, at, at the same time, where you know. He was handing around this beverage that um, had you know, peyote and a variety of other kind of uh, intoxicating substances in it. And the people at the time, you know, were writing about it in, in the newspapers and all that. This was sort of the thing that was giving him a bad reputation. Um, but the OTO happened is that Crowley had written a book called The Book of Lies. And this is sort of where his sense of humor and his brilliance kind of worked against them. Because if he didn't know his philosophy and if he didn't know Kabbalah and he didn't know a variety of other rather arcane, esoteric sorts of things, you're not going to get many of the, the kind of references that he makes in this book. And it's a book of sort of, I don't know, sort of aphorisms or it's like, you know, just something on a page or maybe even two lines or something like that. But there, there are these strange kind of... Um, Puzzles or like Zen koans or something along those those lines. But one day there's a knock on his door and this fellow Theodore Royce turns up and he's, um, you know, one of the high ranking members in, in the OTO, which is the Ordo Templi Orientis or the Order, Order of the Oriental Temple. And he basically comes to complain to Crowley that Crowley has given away, <clears throat> excuse me, the secrets of their order. And Crowley doesn't know, you know, what he's talking about. And he said, well, you know, it's a secret to me as well. And, he, and so uh, Royce opens up the book and he points to it. And um, it's a particular passage where uh, Crowley is talking about having, you know, the magical rod and the mystic rose and, and so on and so on. And it turns out that Royce is saying, well, the OTO, as you say, is, is um, a, a magical group that's devoted to a practice of sexual magic and it goes back to the ancient templars or at least that's the the idea that it does <clears throat> and crowley thought well well i I've, I've been you know mad about sex since i've been 11 years old or whatever it was 13 i didn't know i was doing magic at the same time and i do magic too but oh you put them together and it's like wow and it was sort of, sort of like it it was a revelation to him that you know you could use sex for magic i mean he was still doing even though he was sort of experimenting with doing sort of the magical ceremonies in different ways. I mean, you know, you start out with all the robes and all that. And as I say, he kind of, this one time on horseback when he was going, uh, you know, across China, he was doing it in his head. It's, in a way, that kind of is the beginning of what later became known as chaos magic, where you sort of use whatever's at hand kind of thing. So, but he was still doing ceremony in, in some kind of way uh, and working up, you know the the excitement, the the, the enthusiasm that, during the ceremony to to charge the magical, you know, the will and the imagination. But he said, "Oh, 
God, you know, you can you can use sex to do that. And then he said, well, sure, well, I want to join, basically. And then his own, you know, prestige and brilliance and, you know, um, genius and all that quickly uh, led him to become, you know, the sort of the head of the order and all that kind of thing. And yes, it's it's still it's still around today. I, I know a few people that are involved. And they're all very nice people, you know, and, the, and they take it seriously. Um, you know, there's websites and there's different groups. But there's one, I think, officially recognized kind of, of uh, group these days, but I, there is a kind of infighting, which is generally, you know, happens with all these kinds of things. But yeah, it's, it's still here. I mean, in his last days, um, in Crowley in, in the late 40s, uh, he was being um, supported by, uh, mostly by donations from um, the Geo chapter in Pasadena, and this was the famous one that Jack Barsons, who was the rocket scientist, uh, he was a you know rocket scientist by day, but a <clears throat> Crowley magician by night. Then the OTO chapter that he belonged to was sending uh, Crowley care packages, you know, to keep him going. Founder of the of Caltech. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I guess yeah. I, I haven't seen it, but I think there was a, t- a TV a TV or whatever uh, online show or Amazon show called Dark Angel, I think was something about that as well. Or, so it's, it's again, it's a part of the Crowley world that has kind of permeated the, the popular culture. And there's also a link there when you mention Jack Parsons with L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology. Well, I mean, the, you know, the story is that Hubbard learned learned everything he knew about making Scientology from, you know, being involved in Parsons, uh, Crowley, um, you know, uh, coven, as it were. Uh, and that's a whole other story. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a fabulous story. And um, But, um, yeah, I mean, but Hubbard, I guess, you know, in a way, he's a Crowley in character in the sense that he's um, – you know, basically he's very big and he does everything his way. And, you know, um, it's, uh, he has this kind of power and he dominates. And I mean, again, this Crowley identified with, um, Ayn Rand or he had, and one of the last, again, the last days he read the fountainhead and he identified with Howard Rourke. And, uh, and again, you could see this kind of, you know, uh, basically, you know, the, the powerful individual, you know, not, not held back by, you know, the, the limits of society and so on and so on. And it's mm-hmm. a common trope. You can find it in different places. I mean, some people have associated Trump um, with Crowley, uh, sort of the kind of, because the Howard Rourke is Trump was a reader of uh, the Fountainhead and, and, and identify with Rourke as well. And, and he, he can be seen as a kind of magician, but let's not go there. Well, I there, think we, did, we did we did that one already. <laughs> <laughs> There's also Sorry. this this sense uh, th- that I get of, of Crowley sort of identifying with the British upper class at a time when uh, the British Empire was probably the largest empire the world had ever known, and uh, you know I I think a lot of his arrogance comes out of uh, that milieu, which which wasn't so uncommon in in his era. No, I mean, in many ways, I mean, he he wanted to be recognized as, you know, a British gentleman. I mean, I think he that he's finally got it now. I mean, he's finally he finally belongs to the club that wouldn't, you know, have him uh, as a member. As I said, he's become sort of neutralized and part of the the British tradition. He's a grand old man, you know. Yeah. Uh, 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 well, he, in many ways, he is. So, but at the time, well. Again, it's a play on words, but it, it, you know, in the 1920s, he was known as the man we'd like to hang. Yeah. But you know, like that, not not he is hung now. He's hung in the National Gallery, but but you know, or the wickedest man in the world. And this was when all the scandal was around him. It was building up already uh, when he was living in in um, in England. Uh, um, but he. Well, one reason is that he, uh, he he wanted he wanted he needed to get out of England, and he also wanted to find a place so he could set up his um, his own kind of community. Um, again, a, a, another kind of magical uh, community. And this is where he he has this place in in Sicily in Cefalu called um, you know uh, the Abbey of Dilemma, the Abbey of Do Without Wilt. Dilemma is a Greek word, you know, uh, for will, and it's also the motto. Uh, in Rabelais' uh, a writing as well, but he has a similar sort of app. And you can find another, other, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, other people, Augustine and uh, William Blake, and so on. But you know, Crowley, this is what he, you know, makes into his philosophy. And this, you know, we haven't even talked about the revelation that he has in Cairo in, in 1904 when he's there with his first wife. And this is where he has um, sort of channeled or communicated to him um, spiritually uh, the text of this this. 
this book called the Book of the Law, uh, which was the, the, the gospel of, of, of his religion. I mean, he had already tried to set up something called Crowleyanity. And, hmm. and but but, but the, the layman, this was something that you know didn't come from him. It was you know it was given to him like you know like any holy scripture or or uh, you know something along those lines. And um, you know in many ways it's very interesting text. It's, it is very much of its time. It's very much like the poetry he would like to write, even though he said it's communicated to him from Iwas, who's uh, you know uh, extra dimensional uh, intelligence uh, and all that sort of thing. But it's very much along the kinds of thing that Crowley would write himself. So, um, but it's this philosophy of the lame of, of uh, do without will shall be the whole of the law. Uh, love is the law, love, love under will. Um, he sets up a community or tries to um, in this um, sort of house he buys uh, in, in, um, in Sicily in the 1920s. And he writes about it in his novel Diary of a Drug Fiend, which is one of the first ones I, I, I read. And, and this is, it's, 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 it's readable. I mean, it's very much of its time, but it's readable. And, uh, um, but it's very much an advertisement for um, the Abbey uh, of the Lema. And it's funny because in the book, it's about people, two people that are basically hooked on cocaine. And, and, and they go to the Abbey in order to basically break their addiction, break their habit. And uh, Crowley maintains, or the Crowley character in the book maintains, you could do this by sheer will. Cause, I mean, so there's, there's sort of piles of the stuff all around and you could take it or leave it and it, you know but if you you know develop your will you'd be able to control it and all this and all the while he's writing it he knows this isn't true because he's you know he's writing it in london at the fact you know he's dictating it at, at this incredible speed uh uh to his scarlet woman uh leah herzig at the time and uh they're both knocking it back uh, according to all the stories you know in order to keep going to write this book about you know basically how you get off drugs and um you know, pressed to do it, he just did it, and it's, you know, I said, you know, I think he wrote it in six weeks or something like that, so it's, you know, for something uh, of its nature uh, to be written in a short time shows it pressed, he, he could do it. But um, eventually this place, you know, was his downfall, because, um, I mean, there's a variety of stories of different people being there, um, but in the end, um, someone who was there who died probably really wasn't responsible, but still the whole kind of aura, the atmosphere that uh, created, you know, created it around there and which the, the newspapers created when they, the tabloids. This is where he starts to develop the reputation as the wickedest man in the world. Well, well this is what they call him in, in, in the, or there's one particular tabloid that, that calls him that. <clears throat> I think it's John Bull. And they, or the man we'd like to hang and all that. And, you know, it just basically, I mean, it, you know, for the average person, what he's doing is kind of weird. You know, he's basically you know, <laughs> taking lots of drugs. They're having lots of sex. Uh, they're doing a variety of magical, you know, rituals. He, he paints um, these very strange, grues gruesome, morbid, uh, depending your taste, transgressive um, magical, erotic, you know, paintings on his chamber of nightmares and things of that sort. There's stories of bestiality and, you know, uh, or maybe, I mean, the real story is that they tried, there's one story, I'm just not to get too, too graphic, but there's one story where there is tried, there's tried to be a mating between one of the, you know, the initiates and, and, and a goat, but, you know, the goat was isn't up to it as it were. Uh, and so, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny in some ways and it's actually, you know, I, I I can't imagine no one's made a film of it yet because it's a, if you just take it out of the context, it's a fantastic thing that goes on because a lot of artists showed up and some people go there and they actually have a revelation and somehow, you know, the environment, I mean, there's a famous story of this um, American actress at the time, again, it's in the 20s, a woman named Jane Wolfe, uh, who's sort of a character actress and she was in um, uh, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, you know, it was an early uh, silent film. But she was, you know, sort of, exhausted from the Hollywood rat race and all this kind of thing. And she, she had got into magic and yeah. And, and actually she's in the background of the Parsons, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Parsons set up there. She's one of the early kind of people in California, uh, that, that are somehow into Crowley. And, um, any case she find you know, she hears about the Abbey and so she decides to go. And when she first gets there, what Crowley tells her to do is he says, you, um, he takes her to the sort of, peak you know that's off from you know where the the temple is from where, where the abbey is and there's a lean to and you know he gives her a robe 
And um, she said, well, every day someone will give, come and they'll bring you some bread or fruit or something like that. And you have, you, have the, you have the sky, the earth, the sun, the sea. You have all around you to entertain you. And so she, okay, great. You know, I, I came thousands of miles. You know, I, could have, I could do this in California, basically. And um, at first she's like, that's her attitude. She's really sort of angry that this is all that's happening. Uh, but then over time, she gradually relaxes and she gradually you know acclimatizes to where she is and she feels i guess one day she woke up and, and it, yeah that's that's, that's exactly it i have this guy I have, I have i have the whole world around me i uh, you know she felt you know at one and this was you know someone who actually benefited by i mean crowley i think he did have an instinct you know he had an instinct this is another thing that made him successful in the sense that you know he was able to work his magic with people he had he had an instinct for people you know it wasn't always right but he had an instinct mm -hmm. and you know and something you know I, it worked to his disadvantage sometimes because he always sort of had an instinct for weak people you know i think he had an instinct for people that he could dom dominate in some way easily he didn't there wasn't too many people that he respected you know as, as an equal or he had some people that you know he, he would you know in a way Meet with them socially that weren't into magic or anything like that, and you know whatever uh, 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 other you know writers or you know whoever interesting characters. But in most of his relationships, you know, they, they were, it was sort of like you know he he was sort of a dominant character. But I guess you know that would be natural for a guru or a mage or whatever you want to say. But I think you know it, he sort of um, it was a weakness of his after a while. Um, but he also could see in some people you know what they needed. And there was another you know someone else who who came there. And basically, Crowley just explained, uh, basically explained the unconscious uh, to this sort of middle-aged uh, uh, man who came there, and uh, who you know lived a whole life of worry and concern, and you know, um, not, you know, you know, responsibilities, and, and and so on and so on. And Crowley just basically, you know, told this whole like, you know notion of the unconscious and repressed, and you know, you have to let you know what's been repressed out, and all this kind of thing. Sort of Freud 101, um, and it just bang. Mm -hmm. it, it it hit him and you know and he went and did that and he had a revelation so sometimes he you know he hit the bullseye his writings on magic and and he wrote extensively about magic uh often have a, a psychological bent to them he seems to be one of the first people to interpret uh ancient magical principles in terms of modern psychology well, this is the thing he wanted to do. He wanted to rehabilitate magic as, as um, you know, scientifically, and philosophically respectable pursuit. And yeah, this is what he does. He updates it, you know, very much for the time. Um, and yes, again, it, it's moving away. I mean, one of the early, one of his earliest books on magic, Book Four, is is a, is a you know, he, he spells out his principles very clearly. Um, and he, there's a, not a lot of the kind of um, this labyrinthine. Um, trapdoor kind of trope that you find in the later books, like the book that he said he wrote for everyone to sort of rehabilitate magic, magic in theory and practice. It's not immediately. <laughs> I mean, I, I read it several times and um, and actually worked my way through, you know, some of the rituals in there. And all this is many, many, many years ago. But it's not immediately, you know, open and available. But that and. And when I later read book four, I said, oh, oh, okay, this is more straightforward. And so in many ways, if someone asked me, I would say, well, read that one first. I, I think there's a volume where they, 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 they're together and all that one. But book four is something you wrote earlier. And then, yeah. you know, Magic and Theory and Practice, something you wrote in the late 20s. Um, but uh, no, he, he updates it. He basically introduces, you know, modern psychology. Uh, and it, it's not about is it real or not. It's about what do we mean by reality? Uh, that, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. and it's about the uh, again. You could, you could see behind him there, there there was this movement away from all of the sort of you know more all, all of the sort of bits and pieces of the ceremony it was away moving away from all that to more about the imagination and the will. I mean that's sort of, sort of the mid nineteenth century Eliphas Levy, who Crowley said he was a reincarnation of. Mm -hmm. It kind of starts with that. Crowley kind of picks up on that, and he he, he does make it more intellectually. Um, acceptable. Uh, at the same time, trying to you know keep the whole idea of magic and uh, I mean you know you can see equ equations between kabbalistic ideas and sort of mathematical ones and and you know uh, non Euclidean geometry and Einstein and uh, much of the stuff that was available at the time and that earlier period before I said so the AA period earlier and uh, a little bit earlier in that Crowley was sort of um, 
looking for sort of scientific enlightenment. And there was a period where he was he was Buddhist for um, a, a good stretch, and he sort of put magic aside, and it was all about meditation and all that. And then he put those things together. So again, it, it is this kind of you could almost say postmodern because he's putting bits and pieces and you know putting it together in different ways. But the scientific illuminism, I think, you know, I think is what he called it. And this this is I mean a really interesting period because he's experimenting with consciousness and and it's the sort of thing you can find in William James and uh, you know other people like that at the time. And um, it, he's not onto the Lema yet, and he's not onto the Book of the Law just yet. And so, in a way, that doesn't get in the way. It's it's and this is why I think he was very good because he did have a good scientific mind. Mm-hmm. Um, he was able to sort of you know break these things down in, into, um, you know, uh, sort of bits, logical bits and pieces that, you know, you could understand and, and put together. A later thing is this uh, short text about um, yoga. I think it was originally called Yoga for Yellow Bellies or something like that. That was a series of lectures he gave in the 30s. That's another very good example of this kind of clear prose and very st- straightforward um, approach where something that in many other ways is sort of mystified, he's saying, well, let's demystify it, and here, here's the nuts and bolts of it. He's, he's, he, no, he's, he's very, very, very good at that. Let's talk about his concept of the Scarlet Woman. He seemed to need to have for his rituals a particular kind of female, and, and he went through quite a few of them along the way. Um, yes, well, this comes from his uh, early reading of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Book of Revelations. Um, the Bible was one of the few books he had to read when he was um, a kid, basically, and um, as his mother, you know, controlled um, a lot of his reading, and but so um, being an imaginative sort, he he you know he 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 grew to like um, the Book of Revelations, and he began to identify with you know different characters, and obviously the Beast. He's known as the Great Beast, and you know it, it, the story is his mother. You know when he turned, you know when he went over to the dark side, as it were. Um, uh, his mother basically said one day, "Or you know you're you're a beast, you're bad, you're as bad as the beast, and the you know whatever." And that, something along those kinds of lines. And some people say the story is apocryphal, but and you know he identified with that. <clears throat> and and in the and there's this other character from the Book of Revelations who's the Scarlet Woman, and uh, she rides on the beast and all this sort of thing. And Crowley and this was a particular kind of woman that Crowley needed for these particular sort of magical ceremonies. I mean, he had, he did magic and sex with other women, but they weren't always the Scarlet Woman. The Scarlet Woman, and, and she, she held a certain position. This was the thing, too. It wasn't, it wasn't the woman, it was the position. You know, so, you know, one can, one could have the position or occupy the position of the Scarlet Woman for a certain amount of time, but um, things would change. And mostly what would change would be the age of the woman. Uh, I mean, I don't mean to reduce it just to that or, you know, Crowley's interest in her, but I mean, the, the one who was the longest is this one woman named Leah Hetzer, who he met in New York um, and uh, brought back uh, to England with him. You know, she, she, she was the one who was in Chefalu and she, you know, she, she, she basically went through hell with him. I mean, literally, um, part of, part of their relationship was this sort of magical kind of, you know, almost S&M kind of relationship where Crowley's sort of, um, obeisance to her, submission to her was part of his sort of dying out of his ego and all this kind of thing. And he records this in his diary and, and, and all that. Um, but, you know, at a certain point, she lost the magical charge, uh, as it were, and she would be replaced by someone else. And I forget how many there were exactly. And, you know, I think they occupied um, the, the title for, you know, different, different lengths of time. But as you say, yeah, there were quite, there were quite a few. And um, it, it was basically someone who would collaborate with him in these different magical rituals having to do with sex and as I, you know, something along the lines I just said. And um, it, 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 again, it comes out of his identification um, with these characters from the Bible that, um, you know, when he first read it, it basically stayed with him and he acted it out, you know, for the rest of his life. You mentioned uh, in your book that probably the most readable book uh, that he's written about magic uh, is called Magic Without Tears. I think it's one of his last books. Yeah, this is a collection of letters um, that um, answers to letters that people had written him um, 
over over the years, and I think it was originally going to be called uh, Alistair Explains All or something like that. But it's 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 sort of like a correspondence course or a kind of you know how to, and it's very readable because it's it's written in, you know in his later life, and he's just very you know expansive. And again, if you can uh, just accept that that the way it's going to be, it you know it's something that you could uh, take as a good introduction to. Magic, but you know his, his you know particular brand of magic. But um, I mean, just it, it's it's a very readable last kind of look, you know, gentle walk through these dilemmic lanes that he had you know been mapping out uh, uh, for many many years. And the other thing that you know uh, his his book on um, tarot, the Book of Thought. This is one of the things from uh, Lady Frida Harris, you know, the artist who who did did the the, the paintings. Uh, she and Crowley collaborated in uh, the last years and produced. And again, this is probably, I mean, along with Magic and Theory and Practice, this is probably one of the most influential uh, books um, that, um, you know, he wrote. That That's still, you know, something that um, people refer to. And the Tarot deck, I think, is really unusual and, and beautiful. Truly, it seems to kind of combine, uh, you know, early 20th century modern art with uh, ancient tarot. And uh, I think it does a very elegant job of it. No, they're fantastic paintings. I mean, she, she, had, she had studied uh, projective geometry with um, people that were um, students of Rudolf Steiner's. And uh, that's that, that's informing, you know, some of the images as well. But they're very vibrant, vital, bright, um, powerful um, images, which you could, you know, you could just look at them and meditate on them, even if you didn't know much about the tarot or you know much about the imagery. They they're powerful enough to do that, and they're based on Crowley's sort of directions. I would say that the the the, te the text follows each of the you know each of the cards, mostly the trumps and all all that sort of thing. And again, he he he, he manipulates the cards, so he moves a couple of them around in different places to accommodate his own peculiar kabbalistic way of of reading it and all that. But again, uh, it's a fascinating you know journey through the tarot and those images have they have a real power. So yes, if you haven't seen them, I mean, I, I would go out of my way to to find them. And the lady Frida Harris, the artist, uh, yeah. remained a, a close friend and confidant and student of of Crowley's. And to, I gather from your book, uh, was not involved with him in terms of any of the sexual rituals. Oh no, no, no. Well, I, I think by that time he probably couldn't, you know, do uh, <laughs> it. They didn't have that kind of relationship. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, she. He, um, well, he, he had he had quite a few visitors in, in his last days. He was living in um, uh, this place called Netherwood, which is uh, an apt um, name for you know Crowley's last resort. As uh, this book that I contributed to, it was titled about the place. And this is in a um, place called Hastings, which is on the coast here. It's not far from London, uh, but it was a very interesting. Um, kind of boarding house where the people who ran it were artists or they were theater people and they wanted to sort of have a place where uh, interesting people could come to for the weekend and they would meet and talk and have conversations. You know, unlike today, they weren't never, not, not everybody was on their phone uh, checking social media. So they would, oh, yes, well, let's go stay at, you know, this interesting place over the weekend. And different people were there. You know, Jacob Bronkowski uh, was one of the people there. C.E.M. Joe, he's not well known today, but at the time he was a well-known sort of popular radio uh, kind of philosopher. Uh, and a variety of other sort of people from that milieu. And so having sort of found a perch in a variety of different places. The other thing with Crowley, he was always moving. You know, he did, he was hardly ever in the same place for very, very long. Um, he, he found, you know, um, these people he knew, you know, found him a room at this place. And then uh, he was there and he had, um, you know, interesting people. Peter Brook, uh, the film director, when he was a very young man, um, he visited Crowley and he actually got Crowley to um, – play a part in, in, in a production he was doing at the time. Uh, E.M. Butler, who was an um, uh, academic who wrote a great deal about magic and, 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 and an influence on culture, she uh, interviewed him there. Um, Richard Ellman, who was a biographer of Yeats and, and other people like that. And there were many other, many other people who came mm -hmm. and, and uh, to see him. And, and sort of, you know, and he was a very different character then too. He had lost a lot of weight. He was very uh, shrunken. He was more like a Gandalf. You know, kind of, kind of magician uh, at the time. Uh, at the time, but he was still taking an enormous amount of heroin. Yeah. Um, and this, um, he tried to kick the habit many times, and he and and, and he couldn't. Um, this 
this was, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I would say one of the things that he contributed in many ways was his account um, in the 1920s uh, in North Africa of trying to break his heroin mm. habit. Mm. Uh, it, it's, it's a remarkable account. Uh, and and um, he doesn't give himself any breaks, uh, and he sort of follows all the you know the dodges and all the uh, you know whatever um, stories he tells himself to give him a reason to have the shot or whatever it is and all that. And uh, I think that's something that you know it probably contributes to just you know uh, our understanding of addiction uh, itself. One of the interesting things you mentioned, Peter Brook, the director, as I recall, he. Uh, directed the film and probably the stage performance of Murat Saad about uh, mm -hmm. the Marquis de Saad and the French Revolution. And it strikes me that Crowley is in many ways a character in the same uh, vein as the Marquis de Saad. Yeah, I guess in the sense that... Um, the antinomian team. quality. Yeah, antinomian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, no I, I think it very... Yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, this kind of antinomian character... Mm. That was the thing. He was sort of against the rules. You know, he, he was beyond um, societal rules or he understood things. Um, you know, he had a certain vision of the world uh, and, uh, and he followed it through. I mean, you can find many other kind of characters like that. I mean, I think Crowley, you know, he's in the same kind of category in different ways as sort of the surrealists or sort of the beats or, you know, some of the early existentialists or the punks. And they're, they're you know. This is something that I think is just part of um, our sort of uh, psychology. I mean, I, I, I call it sort of liberationism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just as a handy way to point to it. This is whole kind of philosophy of liberation in the sense that if only we can get rid of all of these constraints. I mean, it goes, you could say it goes back to Rousseau, the whole idea that, you know, we're born, you know, we're born free, we're just everywhere in, in chains, you know, we're, we're we're natural, we're, you know, we're, we're good, we're perfect, we're, we're pure and pristine, and then it's civilization, society, and it's, it's demands that, you know, warps us in some way, and if only we could get rid of that. And, you know, it's a wonderful idea. It, wouldn't it be great if that was the case? But it doesn't seem to be the case, because all of the attempts to do that don't seem to, you know, result in what what you what you want and in many ways the whole kind of anything goes or you know complete freedom absolute freedom in the end turns into uh it, it's opposite in, in different sorts of ways so one of the things i say in the book about crowley is I, I, I say i think we owe him a debt of thanks in many ways because i think he 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 went out into the jungle he was one of the figures out front with the machete cutting through you know uh the dense undergrowth and uh he his path kind of was a cul-de-sac it didn't go you know exactly or it went off in different directions. So we don't have to go that way. And he showed us, I think, in many ways, like, you know, you know this doesn't work. And I, I don't mean that in a facetious way. I, I, I do think, you know, you do need these explorers to, to go out. And yeah, you have a, you have a decide and you and I can read about him and, uh, and, and discuss it. But we don't have to try to, unless we feel so inclined, I, I guess some people have, people like Foucault and others in different sorts of ways, you know. But, you know, we don't feel inclined to go and have to, to do that, because I think we can use our imagination and see, like, well, it, as you said, you know, it didn't seem to end up very well for him. Yeah. It doesn't seem to end up very well for well, people he, who follow he, his path. He died in 1947, yeah. uh, but then by the you know, 20 years later in the mid 1960s, you have the Rolling Stones and Sympathy for the Devil, and all of a Beatles. sudden. And the Beatles, uh, this, this whole counterculture generation, uh, oh. with rock music and sex and drugs, all of a sudden, oh. well, he Alistair, rediscovered. yeah, rediscovered and, and, uh, looked up to. Famously, there was a sort of full page spread about him in, um, this magazine here in London called International Times. And uh, the people involved in it were friends with the Beatles and all that. And they basically showed Crowley as a sort of proto hippie in the sense that, you know, he was polymorphously perverse. You know, he was he was you know he was sexual liberation, drug experimentation, you know, social experiment, different ways of living, and all that kind of thing. And so, and then <clears throat> there was a book that came out by Richard Cavendish called The Black Arts. That was um, it was a very well written, intelligent book about the occult. I mean, this was sort of mid decade, and you already had the other half, first half of the decade, where you have the sort of occult revival starting in about 1960 with the book Mad, uh, uh, Morning of the Magicians, you know, mm -hmm. being published in, in Paris. And then that kind of kick-started this whole occult. And then you had Leary's thing happening too. So you had the sort of the new psychedelic mystery religion happening. And then all these things come, as I talk about in my book, turn up if you mind, all these things come together. And Crowley becomes kind of a poster boy 
for because you know the whole cult revival of the 60s was was a revival so mm-hmm. it's going back to stuff from you know earlier times and mm-hmm. that the stuff it's going back to was a revival of stuff in, yeah in the first but, place but too. crowley right. saw himself as sort of the prophet of a new age mm-hmm. Well, this was the, the yes. This was the book of the law. There was a new age coming. Uh, well, the new age had started in 1904 uh, when he had this revelation in Cairo, and uh, it was going to be the age of force and fire. It was the age of the crown and conquering child. You know, we had the age of the, of the mother, Isis, and the age of the father, Osiris, and now it's the age of Horus, who was a child, who's free of all the law. And again, this is not too far distant um, from Giacomo de Fiore, the, the Christian. Um, sort of spiritual uh, mystic who uh, he, um, he he envisioned three ages, you know, and there was the age of, you know, it was like Trinity and all that. So mm-hmm. it's not too far away from stuff that, you yeah. know, we can find in other places. But, you no, know, Crowley predicted this coming and it was going to be this age of liberation, the age of the will. And this was, but, you know, it, it, it wasn't just everybody gets to do what they want. You have to develop your will. You have to, you know, you have to master it and all that. And then, and then it's, you, and find your true will. This is the whole idea to find, you know, what you're, and again, it was so, it, it's more like a Taoistic sort of thing the more I think about it because it was like you have a path. You have a way in the world, and the problem is our ways collide. But if each of us gets on our true way, then we all will somehow be able to go without yeah. bumping into each other. And Crowley was always – he was on his way. The problem is other people, they just getting getting in his way, as it were. And um, but So this was the sort of thing. If you, if you found your true will, um, then you, know, uh, you, 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 you would be able to live – well, this new age would be the age of those who were able to do that. And the slaves shall serve. Again, there was this whole idea that the, those who didn't master their true will, the masses and all that, they would somehow be happy, um, you know, accommodating those who did and all this kind of thing. And so, uh, I mean, um, it, you know, it depends how you look at it. Uh, some people <laughs> say, yeah, some, that sounds, strikes me as a bit adolescent, but, you know. Another one of his uh, phrases for which he's famous, one of his pithy statements is, uh, and it always impressed me, uh, every man and woman is a star. Again, this is that idea, the stars have an orbit. You know, from here, we don't see the stars, you know, colliding, even though apparently they do every now and then. Uh, but, you know, so, it's, you know, it's Pythagorean, it's Platonic. Um, mm-hmm. hermetic idea, you know, there's a course, there's, I'm sorry I'm moving around, there's an order, a course to things, and, um, you know, if each of us found our own orbit, our own natural course, then we, we would move in that kind of harmony and that kind of thing. And, uh, no, again, what's wrong with that? That, that, that That's a good idea. Um, easier said than done. And I would say that in many ways, that's sort of the, you know, aim uh, of most kind of spiritual you know, traditions or paths and in a sense, you know, find, find, find your own real place in the world and all that kind of thing. Um, it just, I think with Crowley, it just, it, 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 his way of doing that was very disruptive. Uh, and not to say he was the only one. Again, there's, there's the whole, there's a whole kind of um, canon of, yeah. of characters where, that, where that's the case. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely, you know, it's a, it is a wonderful, it's a wonderful phrase. And there's a wonderful story about him when he was in New York and he took this magical retirement and he went up to Hudson and he um, stopped at an island. Well, I forget the name of the island right now. But uh, he had brought with him cans of paint and rope and tackle and all this kind of thing. And he, some, he somehow lowered himself over the, the cliffs. Uh, so he was facing the cliffs and back to the river. And he painted that. Every man and every woman. So he was a graffiti artist as well. You know? So he painted every man and every woman as a star. So people going... <laughs> <laughs> people uh, both going up the Hudson, they would see they would see yeah. that. And uh, I, I don't know if it's the case, but I, I wonder. In, in the book, I say there was that um, song by Sly, Sly and the Family Stone, "Everybody Is a Star," and I think it was either '69 or '70 or something like that. And I wondered if that again that was a kind of a Crowley idea that had seeped seeped through. Well, it does seem that now uh, we're many many decades. Uh, since his death, it seems that he's become uh, iconic in the sense of larger than life. He's become mo- almost mythologized. Well, I think, yes, I mean, I think that that image that, you know, there's um, a couple, um, the, the one with his, his bald head and he's very, you know, he looks like Eric von Stromheim or something like that. And yeah. or the other one where um, he has the, the hood on with the, oh, yeah. the, the shot. 
the shining pyramid and, and uh, the shining <laughs> path. And I mean, I, I often wonder why, you, you, if you remember those old Warhol silk screens, I thought, you know, wouldn't those make you know, a great addition to that kind of thing? And I see, you see T-shirts of that, you see posters and that kind of thing. So I think, yeah, he's been absorbed. And uh, um, a lot of people know, I, I, it, just like many things, they know a vague reference, oh, he's this magician guy and all that. And again, I'm, I'm the last person to be up to whatever, you know, contemporary music I, um, for my sins, I don't pay attention to, but I do. I do know at the time I was writing my book about Crowley that um, you know people like Jay Z and Rihanna or you know um, some of these others that you know it was all about the Illuminati and and it was, you know there's some videos where a duet that will shows up and the Golden Dawn does and a variety of other <clears throat> kinds of things and you know Lady Gaga had had something along those lines and I guess. Kanye West, you know, is he in the Illuminati? Well, you know, who knows? But I mean, so this stuff lives on. And, and again, I think it's a different from what I can gather. It's a different feel to it. It wasn't, you know, you look back in the 60s, it was more, it was liberating. You know, it was more about, you know, what what's new and wonderful for all, you know, for everybody. Look, look at this new wonderful world that, you know, if, you know, if you knew about it, you could take part in it and all that. But this, this other, what I can gather from the, this rap hip hop, you know, uh, uh, kind of world in it, it's more elitist. It's more, you know, exclusive. It's like, you know, the Illuminati, you know, we, we belong to this. And it's, it's it, and the whole thing that like Crowley, you know, he, he fits in with the whole bling kind of thing too he loved wearing jewelry he loved wearing you know shows of power again if you contrast him with someone like madame blavatsky i mean she had you know she had a, her, her own style of of dressing but she she had no interest in any of the sort of uh, mystical insignia or, or the different titles i mean crowley collected titles very different masonic kinds of titles and all that blavatsky didn't care anything about any of that kind of stuff so it's a very different you know, um, uh, kinds of character there, but there was something again. You know, I think Crowley really liked, you know, to show off that that kind of thing, and he would, you know, he he, he would borrow money from people, and um, instead of living on it, he would go buy, you know, some ruby ring or something like that, and and then ask them for more money, and somehow that would seem like, well, it's perfectly all right. I mean, don't you see why? <laughs> <kind of> <laughs> well. Uh, it does strike me uh, that it's interesting that people like uh, Annie Besant or Rudolf Steiner, uh, Crowley's uh, contemporaries, uh, really wanted to have nothing to do with him. Again, I, I would think much like Yeats, that you know, or, or his, his character, his reputation preceded him. Yeah. Although, oddly enough, Rudolf Steiner was a member of the OTO uh, briefly before before uh, Crowley joined, um, and I, I write about that um, a little bit in my my book about Steiner. Um, but no, I mean, they, you know, they just thought he was this odious uh, kind of character. And, and he didn't have a good word, you know, he didn't have a good word to say about any of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, you know, even poor A.E. Waite, who um, was, um, you know, a, a br not brilliant, but, you know, a, a very good scholar of, of um, occult lore and, you know, Rosicrucianism and Kabbalah and all that, and the tarot and many, many other things. And he, as I said, he was the one who basically put Crowley on his path, but he didn't, never had a good word for him. Mm -hmm. You know, after that, you can find these venomous passages in, you know, in, 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 in his confessions uh, and other people as well. And so, you know, um, I mean, the one, there is a story where he supposedly one time went to Gurdjieff's um, Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man in Fontainebleau outside Paris. And this is when he was trying to kick uh, his heroin habit. And Gurdjieff had, well, Gurdjieff worked as a hypnotist um, for many years where he actually did cure people of, of drug addiction. And so one version of the story is this, had, this, this news had got around uh, to Crowley or, the, or Crowley just wanted to check out what, see what Gurdjieff was doing. And again, there's different versions of it, but he goes... And um, in one version, he meets Crowley, and another version, he doesn't. Um, the only sort of account that I know of uh, Crowley himself left was a sort of note uh, about, uh, in his diary, about it, and where he doesn't really talk about meeting Gurdjieff, but he meets one of Gurdjieff's sort of students there, and he shows him around and talks to him about it. But he does say something about, you know, sounds like a tip top man or something. <laughs> you know, so, which sounds, you know. Uh, so, and, and in this other version of the story, they do meet, and, and Gurdjieff is very accommodating to him and treats him very well, uh, all during his visit. And then at the end, he says, Are you leaving now? And he says, Yes, I am. You go. Yes, yes. And they have that exchange for a bit. And then 
okay, you're no longer guest, he said, no longer guest, and then he unleashes this, you know, attack on Crowley saying he was a dark, evil, you know, bad man, and you go and never come here again. So James Webb tells that story in his book, The Harmonious Circle, but I, I've yet to find another reference to it, so I don't know. I think it's also uh, worth mentioning that that Crowley was an inspiration to people like Kenneth Anger, the filmmaker, and I think uh, Timothy Leary found inspiration in uh, uh, Crowley's autobiography. Oh, well, uh, Leary actually said that he was carrying on uh, Crowley's work. And um, if you know, you know, um, one of his, well, Crow, uh, Leary wrote, quite a few biographies and one of them is called confessions of a hope fiend yeah right? so i guess that's a combination of diary drug fiend and and crowley's confessions uh-huh. and um and he, he said in, in an interview uh, later i think it was sometime in the 80s where he talked about you know crowley's influence and there is an account where he and um uh, a companion of his are in the north african desert and they somehow wind up reincarnating crowley and this a poet named victor Neuberg, who um, at some time in 1909, I believe, uh, they um, evoked the demon Koronzon, um, who, you know, is this, you know, a demon of confusion and, and darkness and all this kind of thing. And so, yeah, so um, Leary was sort of modeling himself on, on that, uh, on, 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 on Crowley's kind of thing for a while. And uh, Kenneth Anger, of course, yeah, Kenneth Anger, the experimental filmmaker, um, he, his fantastic film, Inauguration of the Pleasure Day, um, which mm-hmm. is a uh, Crowleyan ceremony on on film, basically. Uh, uh, it's if you've never seen it, it's incredibly rich uh, colors, and uh, the Scarlet Woman is in there. She's played by um, a woman named Marjorie Cameron, who is associated with Jack Parsons. So she she married Parsons, um, is uh, Parsons' widow, I, I believe, by the time the film uh, was being made, and um, and I guess Nin. Uh, the the writer mm. and the lover of Henry Miller, uh, she's in it, and uh, it's shot in this fantastic uh, Hollywood mansion uh, up in the up in the Hollywood Hills. And uh, yes, it's just this is incredible sort of Crowleyan ceremony. Um, and talk about jewels and and bling and all that. It's just filled filled with that, filled with all color and different jeweled goblets. And you know, there's even scenes where people are swallowing uh, jewels and necklaces and things of that sort. And uh, there's other, I mean, the other. Well, Crowley informs, you know, m- most of uh, Anger's films. Uh, the other big one was Lucifer's Rising uh, that uh, took forever um, uh, to be made. And um, people like uh, uh, Jimmy Page contributed to it and uh, others as well. Uh, and eventually it, it, it came out with the soundtrack by um, fellow Bobby Beausoleil, who <laughs> made a name for himself as being part of uh, Charles Manson's uh, uh, family. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and um, the people like Marion Faithful in the film and all that, and it's full of you know the whole Crowleyan idea of the New Age coming and and things of that sort. So, um, but you can even find you know if you go back into like the the thirties, I mean Crowley, there's Crowleyan characters or sort of evil magicians or e- evil characters based on him in in films. Um, there's a, a film called The Black Cat um, with um, Boris Karloff and and Bela Lugosi and the Karloff character is, is based on, on Crowley. Based um, on Crowley the person or Crowley the myth? Well, what, you know, the story. I mean, what, you know, I mean... Um, the myth uh, of... Cause, I mean, the earliest, one, the earliest one, there was a film by a guy named Rex Ingram and it's a silent film. It's called The Magician and it's based on the Somerset Mom novel and the magician in it, Oliver Haddo, is actually based on Crowley because Mom knew mm-hmm. Crowley in Paris in around 1905 or something like that. Yeah. And um, so there's an er- so the character in there is you know, this fictional character is based on Crowley, and then you know, sort of different. I mean, um, um, the Devil Writes Out. That's like probably the f- most famous one. Uh, maybe not to American audiences as much, but this was a Hammer. Uh, British Hammer horror film made in the 1960s mm-hmm. uh, with Christopher Lee and it's based on a novel by a fellow named uh, Dennis Wheatley who was sort of a pulp you know, kind of occult writer mm-hmm. um, in, in England and um, Wheatley knew Crowley and um, you know how, how much he really understood magic and all that kind of things another another story but again the the, the, the magician 
the evil magician character in the film is, is based on Crowley. But when we started our interview, Gary, you made a point of saying you didn't believe Crowley was really an evil person. I wouldn't say he was a, I would say he was a dark magician. That, that's how I characterize him rather than a black magician. He's not a black magician. Although some of the things he did, I mean, he, 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 did, he did do some, you know, rather, you know, heinous things, I, I would say. And uh, he acted in, you know, rather ignominious ways at times. I mean, maybe, you know, other people write about him. They might find me judgmental. They might have a different way of interpreting it. That's, that's all right. right. I mean, he's some he's people will say you're sure. going, you're too soft on him. <laughs> oh yeah, too. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I mean, I, as I said, when I, I was, I was an enthusiast when I first got into it. I mean, I, I was involved after when I moved first moved to Los Angeles in the late seventies. I got involved. I got involved in the OTO and I got involved in um, a branch of the AA. And I later realized uh, that this had links going back to. Um, uh, people, people that start that actually knew Crowley mm -hmm. uh, in his last days in the forties, yeah. and um, and it was it was interesting for a while, but it, uh, it, it just seems to me more of an Alice Crowley fan club than than yeah. anything else. But I did participate in some rituals and all that, and I, I did do a lot of work on my own and that kind of thing. And I gradually, but the thing is, I got tired of him. Yeah, because that's the thing is that it's very it's very. It's all this way, you know. Um, he talks about an enormous number of things, and he, um, you know, visionary and uh, the cosmos and all that. But it always, you know, all the roads would lead back to him, and I just I found that suffocating after a while. Mm -hmm. And so after you know a, a few years and reading everything, even the poetry and all that kind of thing, I I I gave up on it and you know left it. And then I didn't really pay too much attention to Crowley for. You know, quite some time until, um, what's well, so I say in the beginning of the book, um, I saw that he was sort of being rehabilitated and there were academic studies. I was more interested in like, well, why did he stay this kind of rock icon? I mean, in many ways it's obvious because he was, um, uh, he was an extremist. He, he took everything to the extreme. So that's one reason why he stayed in this iconography when people like Lovatsky and Jung and others who, who people knew about in the, in the, in the 60s, late 60s or early 70s. They, they didn't really stay around as much. And I wanted to explore this whole philosophy, this, this liberationist philosophy, because I want to say, well, okay, well, you know, it didn't work for him, so why doesn't it work? You know, and so that was part of it. But um, My exposure to Crowley came in the 1970s in Berkeley, California, where there was a large occult community, and uh, Crowley was discussed often. I mean, yeah. <laughs> his, na yeah. his name was in the air all the time, and I did get to meet a fellow that you wrote about, Grady McMurtry, yeah, all right. who, who was the head of the OTO, lived in Walnut Creek, California in those days, and I think was responsible for the uh, publication in the 1960s. 60s of the Crowley Tarot deck. Yeah, you're right. So, what, so what, what year would this would have been? Oh, 70, 1970, 71, 72. Oh, that, okay. I mean, I, it was a bit later for me, about 70, 78. Yeah. <laughs> I got involved. So, uh, but uh, yeah, no, the, uh, yeah, I mean, um, again, when, when you know the history, I mean, that in yeah. itself becomes fascinating. I knew a uh, fellow. He, he, I was going to say, he was one of the last people, you know, he was one of the people who was visiting him, you know, in his last days and all that. So, I knew a fellow back in those years who was very talented, uh, creative pianist and composer, and uh, unfortunately, it was in and out of mental hospitals all the time, but he imagined that he was the reincarnation of Aleister Crowley, but he had all these songs about Crowley that he would hmm. perform at parties, like, mm -hmm. is Aleister Crowley really dead? <laughs> Did he do all those terrible things they said? <laughs> In that, you know, <laughs> well, I think that'd probably be a hit on YouTube now. Uh, so he's achieved this immortality, you know, that um, you know that he wanted, um, and you know, people are still talking about him. Well, I guess there's a certain love in the culture for naughty boys. Well, I guess yeah. So these rebels who can kind of, in many ways, they live the lives that lots of people would have liked, mm -hmm. um, or they also give more morally minded people, you know, a good target. Um, you know, to aim their, you know, their complaints and and reservations at, and so on. And uh, again, he's he's a character. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, I, you you wonder if he didn't live this this life of extremes. And maybe he was something of a visionary when he talked about a new age of the conquering child. But it's sort of like it's it's not as liberating, perhaps, as he might have wanted. You know, I I, I could say, you know, there was a book 
many years ago by Robert Bly called the Sibling Society. And um, I, I, I tend, I haven't read it in years, but it just came into mind as you mentioned that, but I've thought of it before. And again, it was the whole idea that, you know, the whole idea of an adult has kind of been sort of, uh, uh, you know, worn down. Hmm. And we're more like into being part brothers and sisters kind of thing. <laughs> you know, this kind of one level kind of family sort of thing. Where, you know, and, and that's that's sort of, you know, the, this kind of child. But it's also, you know, the child just sort of doesn't have to have the responsibilities of the adult. And, you know, the child doesn't have to have um, worries that the adult has. And this was the sort of thing that Crowley envisioned. But, you know, uh, you know, we all know that if, the, if there was a world of children out there, it just wouldn't, you know. Uh, but then again, you know, we know in the Bible, you know, Jesus says, you know, unless you become like children again. Yeah. Um, but it's not the irresponsible. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, it's not this kind of irresponsibility. Mm. And I, I don't mean to sound moralistic or, or puritanical, but, you know, I, I don't think, you know, in the Gospels when they're talking about becoming a child, there's this kind of innocence or it's kind of, you know, return to your, yourself in some way. Um, but it's, I, I don't think it's the same kind of license, let's say, mm. that um, I think, um, unfortunately, you know, many people that get drawn to Crowley's philosophy uh, see. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the thing that they see in it. I think you make the point throughout your book that there is a sense in which his development was arrested, that uh, he never became fully the person he might have been. I think it goes back to his childhood. I, I think this um, combination of, on one hand, having this you know very restricted world, um, and at the same time feeling that you belong to this elite, because like the Jehovah's Witness, only the people who belong to the Plymouth Brethren are going to be saved from the apocalypse, which is imminent, and all that. Uh, and having this father who went around and, and preached, you know, um, to the people, preached his message to them. And then, you know, to have this reversal, um, where he was still doted upon, you know, he, 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 he said he grew up never having to, you know, he never wanted for anything. You know, he didn't know the value of anything, because anything he wanted was there all the time. So I think even I don't get the impression that he was punished that much, even when he, he was you know a bad boy or kind of thing. And then he again he he didn't have to work for anything. I mean, as you say, it wasn't until his forties. I don't think it was until his forties that Crowley realized he had to sort of do something for a living. And this is when he turns to journalism. And he's you know he's writing. Um, well, he's in America during during um, World War One, and he he winds up writing for a pro-German. Uh, newspaper, you know, it's difficult to make a living as a writer. I, I, I know, <laughs> but you know, there's a whole story behind that. He really was a spy working for British intelligence, and there's, there's by now, there's reams of, of, of stuff written about that. Uh, I keep an open mind about it. Um, but yeah, he had sort of, so he didn't really have to struggle um, in his, in his early days. Well, Gary, we yeah, there's <laughs> we could keep going probably. I know for, we keep going. I, I, I feel like oh, there's lots of good things that we didn't get to say about him, and I, I hope yeah. all the people who you know are Crowley like him, uh, Crowley devotees, they don't feel like all I'm saying about him is bad. That's not how I feel about him, but. Um, well, okay. you know, many of the viewers on this YouTube channel are interested because of the parapsychological angle, and, and we hardly touched on it. Crowley himself uh, was uh, reputed to be very gifted. Uh, oh, as, yeah. I, I, I think he knew how to make things happen. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I say in this book and others, I, he somehow knew how to make synchronicities happen, which I, I think is more or less the essence of magic. Uh, and, uh, I don't think he knew how he knew, but he somehow was able to throw himself into a state where things would happen around him. Well, Gary Lockman, once again, a very enlightening uh, discussion about a fascinating uh, individual. Thank you so much for being with me. Absolutely my pleasure, Jeffrey. And uh, it's, it's always a wonderful experience to be on. So I look forward to the next time. Very Thank good. You.